my little introduction for Alice. For Alice. Alice is an Irish artist from Sierra Leone. Is this exact, Alice? I am Irish and Sierra Leonean. Multipli <laughs> in multiplicity. <laughs> but yes, that's, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you. All her production is marked by this double origin. For a long time, she used in her paintings and films a small strange being coming from the anomalies of Sierra Leone, small beings of clay preserved in the museum of Sierra Leone, of which she made a clone, passing from hands to hands and bringing luck. This object is now worn out. But it allowed to introduce in art the collective intimacy. The exhibition of Alice are not only a place for the eyes, but an encounter with the spectators united by a collective practice. The collective, the clay material, the double origin, the black and the white, make Alice's work some, something that can be seen and touches the depths of the intimate. This intimate can be seen through the material, helped by the serpentine line, the equivalent in art of the transcendental in philosophy one of the possible links between art and philosophy. Alice wrote a PhD in philosophy under the direction of John Mellarquet and an artist. She will share with us today some of the developments of her thesis. We have worked together for several years, at certain times every week by Skype. Alice made a film in Paris in which François Laruelle and I participated in a park near our home. I wrote a normally prior for one of her ex ex exhibitions near London. Alice has recently been invited to Munich for two months. She will have an ex exhibition in two in uh, 20, 23rd, 23, and asked me to write text to accompany her work. She wrote together a book chapter, Art and Philosophy, New Solidarities. I wish, Alice, that the serpent and line led her into all possible arts. Thank you, Alice. Merci uh, for the introduction, très gentil, très, très gentil, et généreux. Uh, thank you so much, Anne Francoise, for such a generous introduction. Um, it was also nice to sort of remember all the different things that we have done together over the years. Um, oui. The generosity says the truth. It is a very uh, voilà. <laughs> beautiful and uh, reciprocal uh, relationship of creativity, and I'm very happy to be here, um, and thank you for inviting me. And um, so um, I have two things I'd like to present. So one is uh, kind of a, a reading from my PhD and a little accompany uh, some diagrams that I did as part of that PhD. So um, I think I'll begin with this reading. And then when I'm finished the reading, we might take a pause and then I will screen the films that uh, Anne-Francoise mentioned. And um, it's uh, the suite of films, there's two films, one is uh, the total is called Conjuncture in Film, um, and one of the film's uh, intrication in the park was detailed by Anne Francoise, where I speak with her and Francois in Park Sarah Bernhardt, just down the road from their home. And the other part of the film is called No More Lee, and this I filmed in Sierra Leone um, with a performer and comedian called Peter Pekin. And I'll read a little bit of an introduction to that before we screen the film, but just to give a kind of sense of what will be covered 
in the time that we're here today. Uh, we have about a, an hour and a half. Is that about right? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry, I just saw Jovan's message in the thing and I was clicking to read it to make sure I wasn't being told that I was on mute or something like that. That's great. Okay, so what I'm going to do first, um, so I'll be reading from the PhD and as I'm reading, I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to screen share a visual of the diagram and uh, the reading and the diagram, think of them as sitting together as kind of parallels. They're referenced in the text, but they're also sort of um, simultaneous experiences. And I'll be able to give a little bit of detail on the diagrams um, after the reading, if there's any kind of questions left, then I can also then speak about kind of exactly what's happening in the diagram um, uh, kind of in addition to the text reading. Okay. Um, so a couple of notes on what I'll be reading. So just be aware that this is an extract of a larger text. So there will be things referenced in it, like in chapter two and in chapter one and things like that, that you might not have seen but that shouldn't um, in any way hamper your understanding of the text. So it is an extract. It is also an extract of a PhD thesis. So there'll be some kind of technical kind of aspects of the writing there that I have left in. So it is being read as an extract complete. So um, just, just to have some awareness around that. Um, and I think that's about it in terms of uh, just kind of outlining what's about to happen. Um, so next I am going to screen share my slideshow and uh, prepare the reading. I will read kind of slow. Um, it's for me as much as it is for you. <laughs> so I'll take my time. And of course, um, if you have any questions, maybe take them down as I'm speaking and uh, I'll be very happy to address them at the end of the reading. Okay, so I'm gonna start screen sharing now. Okay. I'm gonna go. I'm just trying to get my notes that I'm reading from on one side of my screen and then you can just see my slides. Is that correct, everybody? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Just making sure the technicalities have all been uh, taken care of. Okay, so as you may know, the presentation today is about materials body and linea serpentinata. So the linea serpentinata is a shared and a conceptual uh, model that Anne-Francoise and I have been talking about for quite some time and so this um these extracts will sort of talk about the the serpentine in the very kind of origins of of of, of my work and how I've kind of been working with that term forward but this is sort of where I started to to engage with that idea. Okay so I'm going to begin the reading now. Yeah. So the heading is non-standard superp superposition, the wave particle and how interference is a model for transdisciplinary practice. So in this section, I will discuss non-philosophical use of the quantum model to rethink how the functions of non-standard transdisciplinary operations can be visualized. For it is here that I believe art can borrow from non-philosophy what non-philosophy has already borrowed from the quantum. That is the collision of disparate knowledges and their superposition within one space or indeed one object. So I quote, it is difficult to talk about science without the help of metaphors. Science is silent while other disciplines are loquacious. Interdisciplinarity is a contingent mixture of silences and words and understanding its regimes cannot be done by direct means. Our knowledge and our non-knowledge is always at stake, as well as our individual and collective relationships to them. That is a quotation from uh, Lara Well writing on, oh, sorry, that is a quotation from Anne Francoise Schmidt. <laughs> and uh, so uh, noting here that uh, Anne Francoise Schmidt's use of the term interdisciplinarity, as she defines it, is not in opposition to what I outline later as a non-standard transdisciplinary approach. I just think that this is different from that move on back to the main body of the text so with that quote in mind the non-standard mode of production is both that of a dynamic process and one of reciprocity without synthesis thus i would maintain 
that while it bears a close resemblance to Felix Guattari's transdisciplinarity, the non-standard form attempts a nuance which shares more with the quantum than with sketchal analysis. Responding to Larawell's first in-depth writing on an artwork, a drawing made alongside music by the artist August van Vliesen, Alexander Galloway wrote, In the last instance, the object of art is truth. What does that mean? Although truth is not particularly important category for Larawell, as it is for, say, Heidegger or Badiou, the use of the term here signifies a finite or fused relation of pure immanence. In short, truth means the one. Using the logic of difference and reversibility and extending and radicalizing them, to an almost unidentifiable degree. An aesthetics of truth is one with a direct and immediate image to the real. Hence, von Friesen's drawings are directly in the real of the music because they are musicographical relation itself, that in itself. So quoting Larawell, Galloway continues, von Friesen, the secret goal, in von Friesen, the secret goal is to show how every graphical phenomenon immediately represents a musical phenomenon and reciprocal as well. This is a superposition or a shortcut of the typical cycle of art in which composers create the music and listeners appreciate, experience or interpret it. Instead, from the reason proves, the other can be a circularity of interpretation in which drawing interprets music and music interprets drawing. Thus the essence of the work resides in what Larawell had previously determined as musicographical difference. That is, the tension of forces that are always both musical and graphical. The reversibility of music and drawing that ensures that the truth does not concentrate itself in one side or the other, because that would simply be a return to the classical conception of truth as philosophical sufficiency. Rather, here, through a logic of metastability or superposition, the truth of art is realized through the perpetual withdrawal or visualization of truths as a one. So on the screen, you can see I've presented two diagrams. One is an original representation of the quantum double slit experiment, which you may be familiar with. And the second is my own repurposing of that same model in service of a visualization in this case of art and philosophy, though ultimately this could apply to any forms of knowledge. So the two suffixes used before the word disciplinary to transcribe practices that emerge or are in response to spaces between discipline are inter, meaning between, among or amidst, mutually, reciprocally, together or during, and trans, the procession or possible intersection of an intermediate or undefined set of elements. So having a look at the uh, diagram, um, we are thinking about these two apertures and this kind of resonating wave or undulation uh, emanating from the real, the one, truth, our wave source in this case, and the uh, collisionary process, which I kind of mark out as the transdisciplinary space. So each aperture develops its own set of waves and direction, and is also only a small uh, space for these, for the one or truth to pass through. So it is a fragment. It is kind of pressurized through um, this aperture and what I would see is the kind of things that construct this sort of concrete structure are the constraints of any particular knowledge form and practice. And this is what uh, codes or shapes the waves that emerge. And um, so on this side, we have art, on this side, we have philosophy. Each are uh, constrained by particular uh, technical, linguistic, and formal uh, or uh, um, allow the truth to escape through their narrow aperture. When they come together, we have more of the real, more of the truth coming together. And these, um, and in this sort of messy space, there is this collision. 
And so it is a kind of a deconstructed and then reconstructed idea of the um, of the two slits experiment. It also is very much owing its heritage to Lara Wells' idea of the quantic night um, and um, this kind of uh, black box, this unknown space where the outcome is not certain and the inputs are subjected to changes and interactions that change that fundamentally alter the sum of their parts. Um, the world is, in a sense, the uh, the surface that the wave echoes against. And I always think of the detector as the uh, the, the viewer or the subject, the person who takes it all in, and um, and also in their way influence the person or influences the experiment through their presence, through their observation. So these kind of ideas inside the quantum and um, and quantum physics at a very 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 entry level. <laughs> Um, kind of way are things that have really uh, kind of caught my imagination and, and really underpinned a lot of the thinking that I tried to do in the PhD thesis. So, um, I just want to do a little aside talking about the diagram there since it seems to be quite important for it um, to hold because it's not necessarily obvious what we're actually looking at. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm going to return now back to the reading if I can find my place. <laughs> Where was I? Um, uh, yes, we were talking about interdisciplinarity, so the different kind of, uh, within this idea of inter and tram, so transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, and um, these two different words, you know, inter meaning the between, among, and the midst, um, in the midst of, mutually, reciprocally, together, enduring, and trans being the slightly more dynamic word for me, so it's about procession, or possible intersection of indeterminate or undefined sets of elements, and so the trans and um, the trans and um, the transness of transdisciplinarity is something that I was very, very interested in. Um, and I've settled on that as the term that I use. And um, also because it's kind of referenced to this idea of, kind of, of the transcendental um, and um, this kind of transitional situated indeterminacy of transdisciplinarity as a mode of practice as well. I kind of, uh, stay with and work through in the thesis. So I'm going to move on. So taking the wave phenomenon. In our diagrammatic model as our example, we can observe the process of quantification that the non-standard method performs. In our previous matrix, um, described by Lara Well, and um, the previous matrix described by Lara Well makes a part of this process, and due to its asymmetry, and, and sorry, <laughs> due to its asymmetry, that process is open, and its beginning and at its end, and thus it produces something different than, than its more enclosed alternative. So the collider, Lara Wells Collider, which is what I'm making reference to in this little paragraph there, uh, produces an aleatory probability made of the bifurcation or multifurcation of the real and its collision and processual superposition in one. The product of this collision of disciplinary waves, as Lara Wells describes, is always in underdetermined, aleatory and unknown until the last moment of its manifestation. So like a collaborative process with multiple and unknowable contingencies, this collider produces outcomes beyond the measure of its originary points and in that way also breaks all laws of classical physics. So for me, there's a really nice kind of resonance here with what it is to work with other people and the um, kind of active collaboration, which I have enjoyed um, with uh, Anne Francoise, but also with other um, artists and musicians that I've collaborated with. And so when I was writing this PhD, it was really about seeing these kind of resonant models for thinking and for doing, um, proposed by Anne Francoise and, uh, and by Francois Larouel, and this kind of uh, possibility for these two kind of projects of thought and making to uh, aid one another. And that's very much the sort of impetus for the, for the thesis and for the continued work of the thesis. So I'll continue to read now. I would put, um, so <laughs> I would here put forward the possibility that the more iterations of the real via the diverse bifurcations of various operations, that is the attempts at interpretation performed by each discipline, um, the more aspects of the real are made visible based on the culmination of its diffusions impacting the world. So the more the better is kind of what I'm kind of thinking of. So this idea of multiple, Forms of knowledge, democratic in the sense that all the thoughts are equal, uh, um, and they each have different apertures and allow different parts of the real to become um, experienced or manifest in the world. Um, 
and they are all partial. So none is whole or total, and they are all uh, underdetermined and um, minor in their expression, but through their coalition or their uh, um, collaboration and um, conspiracy, if you want, um, more of the real can be made visible and culminated and um, impact in the world. And so that's the kind of the message of this idea of virtual transference and the system of that. So the effects of what I will call the processual indeterminacy of trans, mm -hmm. of the trans in transcendent and transdisciplinary mm -hmm. um, can be given nuance as imminent gestural movements between the disciplines. It is here I believe that art can borrow, as Lara Well and as uh, Schmidt have done, from the quantum as a model. That is the visualization of the trajectory of disparate knowledges as weights emanating from the real, imminent and passing through the gap in the mediating wall of their respective histories, which perform minimum regulation on them. And in their respective radiation, their equal but singular formations conjugate, collide, and form a non-unitary dissonant unity through superposition within one space as they impact on the world. So I propose that this model can be used to support a revision of how transdisciplinary practice is viewed that is no longer framed as a coordination of parallels, but rather an underdetermination of coexistent potentials whose measurable effects are affected by the partiality of the observer's position and the methods and platforms of that observation. For non-standard thought, this model of collision enables the visualization and extension of a subject superposition across disciplines, which can bring together two heterogeneous or even contradictory acts into one without simply adding them together in the summation of their aspect. For while this is an integrative practice of looking towards the other models of knowledge, looking towards other models of knowledge, the operation of the collider is one of non-commutativity. Non-standard philosophy explores the properties of this collider Inside this, philosophy collides with quantum mechanics to create what Lara Well calls the minor, which forms the elemental structure of a non-standard thought. This schema is a modeling for quantification, reproducing the quantum in philosophy. We use the schema as a model for a treatment of philosophy. Quantum mechanics operates on philosophy, but it is not reciprocal. Now to return to non-philosophical thoughts on the standardized circularity of philosophy. Okay. Now to return to non-philosophical thoughts on the standardized circularity of philosophy as an art of envelopment <laughs> and development. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is to quote Lara Well. Um, so um, I have developed this diagram to demonstrate the non-standard model and its movement through its collisionary process between heterogeneous disciplines. In this diagram, um, the last figure shows the open dynamic flow of directional lines. So the ideas are moving asymmetrically towards a point of intersection with each other, but always are radically open, never forming the circle their trajectory suggests. This vectoral movement is an attempt to break the continuum of envelopment found in the first and second figures to create what I call an asymmetrical relation via an aggregation in difference, a non-commutative multiplication to create a new subject who is radically underdetermined or imminent to its situation. So this thesis presents this asymmetrical vectorial serpentine figure as an image for the non-standard model of transdisciplinarity, a foil to the worlding of philosophy and a model that could be used within the context of art practice to produce collisions and openings made possible via an asymmetrical alignment or conjuncture or conjunctures that do not reproduce or reworld their subjects but support their oneness as radical and imminent. The diagrams up to this point have provided introductory visualizations of the real one as a unilateral opening of imminence. This is in reference to previous diagrams in the thesis, of course. 
the internal operation of non-standard thought and the difference in structure between what Lara Well and Schmidt describe as standard philosophy, interdisciplinarity, and the non-standard model. So for the work of this thesis, these models serve as new ways to think the circularity, exclusion, and reenvelopment, not just of philosophy, but also of contemporary art. In chapter two, I developed this concept of contemporary art as another kind of self-sufficient world, a world that intersects with philosophy, but also subsumes it and vice versa in a simultaneous act of capture and representation. So for every new territory it brings under its logic, contemporary art and philosophy create a new border for that which is not, or more accurately, not yet recognized within the system. For as non-standard philosophy sees standard philosophy, I can also see contemporary art. That is, I see a self-sufficient system that maintains a sense of radical privilege to subsume any and all aspects of knowledge and culture into the service of its concept. It is a system that, even as it claims to get outside itself or to escape its own tropes and shake off its habit, still fails to create anything other than more contemporary art. The ready-made, socially engaged, the precious, the political, the personal, and so on. So perhaps non-art or non-standard art, like a non-philosophy or non-standard philosophy or non-epistemology, um, can only perform itself through a flattened or equalized instance where, where art, and its platforms, histories, and notions of privilege are themselves considered as material or components for creative production and presentation. It may also be where an inter or transdisciplinary practice is one whose components remain in simultaneous and indeterminate process until the moment of their perception. And in that respect, in a state of reciprocity with their instance and the observation of that instance, all of which proliferate thought. So Larry Well writes, exercising within the limits of phenomenal according to real experience, which reduces objectivity itself rather than possible experience, which I would add remains speculative. So what is left to be determined is how the double bind of a previously defined totalizing contemporary art or standard philosophy, which subsumes or makes components of those elements that surround it in a gesture that can be at times violent or univocal, can meet the demand placed upon art to solve or cleanse social or political questions. How can this equation which is so destined to fail or at best simply reproduce itself, be shaken off while still maintaining my contention an authentic yet incomplete expression of it through the vector or the artist as embodied subject. So as you see here, this is a transcription of a diagram that Francois Larawell did um, uh, in Ahrid in 2015, uh, yes. and I, uh, <laughs> I transcribed it. He drew it on. He drew it on a whiteboard, and I and I drew it in my notebook. And this is that drawing. <laughs> so, uh, and Francoise, I think she recognizes it. Um, so this yes. is very. This was the, um, you know, because uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of diagrams. I kind of see the diagram as this kind of uh, um, interstitial language between philosophy and art, you know, because it's drawing. Um, but it's also con conceptualizing and it, it kind of builds its own knowledge as well. So it was very exciting to see this, these ideas drawn. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the, the collider, the quantic <laughs> night. I spoke a little bit about that uh, in the way we have it on, on screen. And um, so I'm going to continue now. Where am I going? Oh, keep losing my space. I do these little. Uh, I was asked, yes. So um, artist as embodied subject question mark. Okay. So. Moving on to a ne the next section. So this section is called Who Witnesses the Quantic Night? Back to the viewer, visibility and observation. So the human, the stranger and the subject equals X. So this idea of the of stranger and the human is, um, and the body is something that really, feels really, really important to me in terms of um, how, um, how to think, um, how to think uh, an identity politics through, um, through non-standard thinking. Um, also how to uh, 
yeah, how to sort of give voice to, to, to kind of variations in experience and, and, and vulnerability. In the in the thesis, uh, yes, implementing the academic research in a thesis that will later define a form of non-standard creative practice by and for as a human, it seems crucial that we return to the principles of our engagement with this underdefined but central figure. In the following section, I will explore the human in question as a non-standardized and irreduce and irreducible to the definitions bestowed on it by language or culture what we will later call the anthropologies or philosophies of the human. Here I seek to draw upon a discussion of the aspects of this figure that are visible, but can in some other way be measured by a particular form of observation. This will be an effort at articulating both their radical originality and their imminence. I will focus on, in particular on how various theories of subjectivity create instances of a forced relation of specificity to history, language, politics, economics, and philosophy. In response to this, I will assert that the non-human, as autonomous from these authorities, is an actor that thinks in accordance with the real, through what Larawell calls the vision in one, as it performs the future in person. This performance is acted out in the world through the body, in the first person, a real identity, which is not bestowed by a moral or anthrop anthropological logos, but always is already given imminently present and inhabited, yet never fully known, a given without givenness. It should be introduced at this early juncture that Larawell's non-standard conception of the human will be specified and extended to include a non-standard vision of the body. That is to say, the radically underdefined human beyond those biological definitions that currently act only as partial appearances of ourselves to ourselves. Or as John Milarka writes in his 2014 essay, The Animal Line, non-standard philosophy is a democracy of thought that extends the definitions of philosophy, logic, questioning, wonder, etc. Beyond the authority of standard philosophical approaches that always humanize it according to one type. Instead, one might say that Lara Well is the first fully non-human, that Lara Wells is the first fully non-human philosophy, though not one achieved through the negation of man, but his extension, a man without humanism that discovers the human. And so philosophy in myriad other realms, yet without these terms becoming vacuous. This is why the question of man is the fundamental one for non-standard philosophy, but only in question form, non-philosophy does not know what or who man is, only that man is indefinite. For the purpose of this thesis, this imminent, radically undetermined non-human identity will be taken as a first principle that will furnish the reader with a way to think a life and its work through a sensitive and indeed sensual aim, a way that does not come into being through the logic of a certain type of thought, but rather conversely produces its own arrhythmic asymmetric movement bringing thought into action and into life through the performance of itself as one through the body in its love, its suffering, and its determination and reaction. Later, I will discuss impressions of vulnerability, exploitation, and the victim, and how these statuses, self-proclaimed or bestowed by power, structure what is possible for a non-human to do in and with the world. I will also discuss practices and present resistance to affirmations of the body and begin to develop a conception of the aggregation of the body as loving collective intimacy. In chapter two, I will develop connections and extensions between my own theory of loving aggregation and Anne Francois Smith's theory of collective intimacy, alongside coextensive theories of the non-standard philosophical subject. In this, I hope to present a vision of non-standard humans as strangers bound together in struggle against the many vectors of violence and harassment that intersect, enclose, and form the matrix of the world we inhabit. With the defense of this radical indeterminacy at the heart of this thesis, I will begin by situating my own body within a conflict of worldly anthropology, or those ideas put upon us which mark its particularity as gendered, radicalized, sorry, gendered, racialized, mixed, and economized, student, worker, artist, I will assert the insufficiency of these theories of nominative 
identity that so in, inadequately attempts to summarize me and my human and the horizon of my universe and those constellations of thought and activity that I am not only capable of, potential, but also initiate and participate in right now, actual. So these terms, the one, the body, identity, the universe and the world, make up the terms of a kind of citizen science through which our thesis, my thesis, sorry, explores the potential for a non-standard relation between art and philosophy to be made. While this will also be practiced through anecdotal reflections of my experiences in the field, testing hypothesis in workshops, producing films, and for the purpose of this chapter, I focus on close reading and digressions from primary and secondary texts. Sierra Well, and Francis Schmidt, Malarka, Paco Gango, Katrina Kiesova, and Anton Kirsten, with a view to later entwining each of these varieties of knowledge and reflection on non standard thought with my experiences and the thought that those, those experiences generate. Together, diversifying our vision, what it is to be a non standard human. There are attributes um, where the attributes of such a name are no longer taken from the history of philosophy, but rather where the details of its specificity are articulated relative to a kind of imminent utility for life instead of an anthropology or inheritance structured by history, where the real conditions of experience and those of the object of experience are identical in the It is then the task of this thesis to build an identity or an image of the non-standard human that remains both imminent and therefore underdetermined until the last instant, with an understanding of the abstractions necessary to present that vision as an image. That is, when we present an image, we represent a singular vision of the world, a moment in time configured both intentionally and contingently by the image maker. The imaging process and the world itself, or so the last century of art theory might tell us. Lara Well, however, takes interest in a different aspect of imaging, specifically photography, as the model for, or rather, a mode of photography. That is to say, he sees in photography a practice not confined to material process that is the physical chemical activity produced in the photograph as an object in the world, but rather one that provides an extended model for producing an imminent or flattened or equalized thought in photo. So this image of thought in photo, according to Lara Well, is one of infinite qualitative depth, but presented in a flat, imminent or horizontal rather than vertical field of vision. What he calls a horizontality without horizon and one which offers a way of seeing which produces its own autonomous form of knowledge, not one subordinated to philosophy and its discursiveness here, aesthetic, but one which is capable of presenting through autonomous intuitive processes aspects of its object identity, which are uniquely visible or indeed thinkable through its model. This model of horizontal imaging is then set to work in opposition to the leveling of a hierarchical imaging model that proposes to fuse differences into a unified identity, where all alterity is counted and integrated by what Lara Well sees as an obsessive compulsive interpretation of philosophy and their subsystems. That is to say, the subordination of all other modes of creative production to that of philosophy. For Lara Well to think or to be in photo instead furnishes us with an image or identity in person, imminent and emergent in non-human essence which exacerbates singularities rather than unifies or unifies multiplicities under the aegis of the unified logic or philosophy. Larawell writes, speaking to the photographer and their subject, photographic thought, rather than being primarily relational, differential, positional, is first of all real in, the, in, the, in that sort of undivided experience, lived as a non-positional self-risen force, which has no need to itself simultaneously on the object to divide with itself, to identify itself with the world and to reflect itself in itself. The ultimate photographic lived experience, that of the immediate self and vision application, the very passion or affect of vision is too naive to be anything other than an invisible flux of vision of which 
it is not even certain whether it will be divided by time. The vision force resists the world, its very plasticity and its, impot and its impotence to separate from itself and to objectivate itself. The existence of the photographer does not proceed his essence. It is his body, his force, indivisible into organs, precedes the world. His photographic stance consists less in situating oneself in relation to the world, in retreating, coming back to it and surveying or overlying it, than in definitively abstracting oneself from it. In recognizing oneself from the start is distant as the processor is seen. Hence, it does not return to the world, but takes the world as a sample support, as a simple support or as an occasion to focus on something else. What we do not yet know. It would seem then that this experience of naive solitude, isolation, abstraction or distance is an effective dimension, is an affective dimension of the vision force of a way of life and pertains quite directly to how it feels to be an artist working in it. It abstracted from it through thought and its limit experience, the things we don't know. Thus for Lara Wells and for me, photography is not a return to things that, sorry, not a return to things, not a return to things, but a return to the body as undivided vision force. Further, it is not a return, but a departure upon that basis constituted by the greatest naivety, naivety which inversely makes possible the most absolute disenchantment. It is a disinterest for the world, the moment when the photographer does not think the world according to the world, but according to his most subjective body. It's precisely for this reason, is what is most objective, most real in any case in the photographic act as a proposal. So then, if at all, would this hypothesis of photo, image and identity contribute to the discussion of contemporary art in a broader or perhaps more axiomatic sense of the practice, where we, ourselves, where we extend ourselves beyond the in photo or photo fiction explored by Lara Well through his writing and look further outside to the discourse of an art practice. So this is the final section and this heading then. For indeed, no one has yet determined what a body can do to quote Spinoza. So it means. Suhail Malik, a very, very interesting art theorist and critic, um, speaking on the currency of experience and interpretation with contemporary art and what he sees as the privileging of interpretation and exception in meaning making within this movement and arts continuing historicization, expresses reasonable doubts in an artwork's contingency and control, and instead sees this indeterminacy as an ethos, which allows all kinds of benevolence, as well as all kinds of abuses of power, from very large institutions to micro relationships between individuals and within the art world. So the art itself is like a chess piece to a set of tactics that know, um, with no particular global strategy. So he's really critiquing the mechanics of the artwork and in a sense it's Malik's critique of contemporary art as, as, a, as a system that uh, kind of created a kind of a building block for me to understand contemporary art in the kind of totalizing way that uh, um, non-philosophy understands standard philosophy of history. Um, so we'll turn to the question now. I need to decide which one I'm interested in because I can see this or I can look at. Okay, where am I? Okay, to take a different interpretation on the presentation of the aleatory objects of creative production, Malik's views, Malik views art, art's open endedness, with suspicion. He contends that contemporary art not only takes different models from outside its discipline to serve its own logic, but that it also, excuse me, reinforces a global socioeconomic strategy that diminishes the human through exploitation and undemocratic, undemocratic distributions of value and resources. How then can the argument be made for a practice of video or artwork as a process of imaging, which functions 
as the imminent traversal of an of a unidirectional force or a force of thought initialized by and for the human through its sensuous identification and self. So how do we do that by the sovereign self system? So this thesis would respond that it is only through a revision of our designations of what thinks and what thought is that we can arrive at a new methodology. So this new methodology, the antithesis to the enclosure of contemporary art, um, will not offer an exit of contemporary art, but rather a new and open-ended point of origin and the chance to never enter into the circularity of the standard offered by philosophy or contemporary art in the first place. So this point of origin is, of course, the radical undetermination of the non-standard human and their aleatory I'm not sure what I can do about the audio. Um, I move a little bit closer. Sorry, just uh, yeah, it just started cutting in and out a little bit, and just be, I'm my, just trying to... be my internet. Um, uh, I can also, I mean, no, this is perfect. Is it I okay? think it is the effects of talking to the void, probably too. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but you I kind of um, don't know what's going on. You're just, you know, you do, you're doing a little bit of like drifting on some of the ends of the sentences, but I think it's just your own thoughts because you're bouncing. I, that's what happens to me. But okay. I think that's because um, you're clear and then the, some of the ends are, are trailing off. Just yeah. like, just clip. Is it an audio issue or is it an issue with what I'm reading? I, uh, up on my end, it's the audio is cutting in and out, but maybe if you, um, if the mic that you're speaking towards is Close. I don't know, just a suggestion. I have no idea. I'll bring it closer. Um, yeah. bring, this is the last section. Perfect. Um, Thanks so much. Sorry. Okay, so this thesis would respond that it is only through a revision of our designations of what thinks and what thought is that we can arrive at a new methodology. But this methodology would not offer an exit, but rather a new and open ended point of origin and the chance to never enter into the circularity of the standard offered by philosophy or contemporary. So this point of origin is, of course, the radical underdetermination of the non-standard human and their aleatory nature, both actual and potential. So this is kind of the, the gesture of the, of the serpentine line. So it, it avoids closure of circularity. So instead of the kind of Venn diagram intersection of a standard interdisciplinarity that still remains, although overlapping and intersecting, it still remains circular. The serpentine um, model never closes on itself, but remains in a kind of a constant process or a constant projection of vectorial um, progress. Okay. Turning now towards our own particular category of non-human, that is the homo sapiens, as I reflect on the above quote from Spinoza concerning the body, written in 1677 in his description of the Africa. And in light of the claims of this thesis, I would modify this statement of non-knowledge, that we do not know yet know what a body can do. Um, to say that we do not yet know what our body is, or rather that we can neither know what we are nor what we are capable of. And it is this non-knowledge or radical indeterminacy of the body um, that this non-knowledge and radical indeterminacy is not just rooted in what Arwell has called the experience of the full and phenomenally positive sense of sororia, um, but, in, but um, is central to the uh, experience of, of existence of human beings. So, um, moving, on. so moving on to uh, think about uh, Katerina Kolosova's uh, enormous contribution to this thinking of, of, of the body and the subject in, in non-standard thought. In her application of non-philosophical principles to the post-structuralist, to a post-structuralist subjectivity, Katerina Kolosova places Larawell's conception of quantum superposition in relation to the indeterminacy of the human person exists as rad in radical solitude, yet in forced relation to the world. Relative to our wave diagram earlier, Kolosova's interpretation was placed at the intersection of philosophy and the originary wave of the severe. 
she presents the physical limitation of our vision of ourselves in conjunction with the forceful identitarianism of the world, as an anthropological sex linguistics seizure of the human. Thus, the image drawn by Kolosova is of a non of a non-human as a body in relation in non-relation to the world. This is isolated from what could be seen as an essentialism of the set theory of the subject, the placed and placed within the complexity of what Lara Wellis described as both the imminent and transcendent aspect of the human and their troubled manifestation of the world, what he and Kolosova call the stranger. The stranger makes the void. It's trans it transcendentally anesthetizes all types of psychological, sociological conditioning. The void is also fully positive qua identity of universal law, which is itself flesh and blood. The content of this void is precisely a transcendental multitude, an auto, a non-autopositional democracy, neither playing upon the logological center nor upon the margins or inequality. Democracy, in this way, destabilizes and neutralizes authoritarian autopositions, which are henceforth made secondary. The theoretical, pragmatic human, in the last instance, is substituted for the violence of the democratic state and its philosophical expression. In his essay, Larry Well, An Ordinary Life, a non-philosophical amplification of philosophy, which takes examples from Husserl, Ryle, and Kolosovsky, Rocco Gangel, sorry, Kolosovsky, uh, Rocco Gangel elucidates the political dimension of what he describes as the ordinary stranger and the implications of Montalotsky's dualysis as a democratic force and how that might translate from a concept to the one of the lib. Non-philosophy does not offer a new solution to the problem of the relation of philosophy to ordinary life, but relativizes and generalizes this problem itself by showing it to be no more than one manifestation of an intrinsic philosophical structure that is universal and necessary for philosophy but arbitrary in itself. Gangle describes non-philosophical non dualysis as a performed process which, under, which undoes the duplicity of the philosophical problems of imminence versus transcendence, which only philosophy claims to remedy, and instead allows transcendence and imminence simply to rest as what they essentially are without submitting these to the reflection of a problematic, a relation, a correlation, or even mere juxtaposition. According to Gangle, Within a non-philosophical method, the terms of all relations are unilateralized as opposed to being problematized or redoubled by philosophical method. This unilateralization is not concerned with the difference or the synthetic function of their relation, but only in their respective utility for the ordinary human. Engel therefore describes the non-philosophical approach as that of freeing both imminent and transcendent tendency from any and all reduplication. For Larawell, democracy is the internal form of non-philosophy as a particular region of thought or unified theory of philosophy. For non-philosophy, it is not an object or reflection of thought, but the essence of knowledge is produced by what Larawell describes as the force of thought, or in the last instance, by the vision in one. This vision in one or optic of imminentist utility safeguards the transcendental qualities of democracy and humanity. For Larawell, the history of modern democracy is established by the idea of a social contract, and the problem of modern democracy, as he sees it, is bound to, to that of the management of contractual and intersubjective situations. This management of the social contract and intersubjective situations, such as those regarding class, or access could perhaps be linked to philosophy's conceptual management of imminence and transcendence as problematic to be solved by it and it alone. Gangel takes from uh, Pierre Kolosovsky's text on the Marquis de Sade and the French Revolution, an example of philosophy's poor relationship to the ordinary human. On the one side, we had the average man who demanded a social order in which the ideal of natural man could prove itself. This call for the realization and idealization of the, idealization of the ordinary man became a beacon for those who had previously been excluded from that category and classed below the level of ordinary man. And on the other side, we had the ruling classes who existed at a higher level 
of life and who, because of the inequity of the social structure, were able to develop what Klosowski describes as super. Um, meta state, there we are. Okay, I'll probably just hi. So, I'm just gonna I'll backtrack slightly just to begin that point again. And um, because I know there were, yeah, my apologies, my connection, no problem at all. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I'll just go from but you states that a political rupture is always a combination of subjective capacity and organization, totally independent of the state. This meta state organization aggregation succeeds in rupturing the current state and transforming the logic it structures. Um, which structure is it? Uh, by virtue of both its subjective strengths and its ability to organize, cooperate and coordinate those strengths in relation to the truths of the situation. The political subject constellation aggregation transforms the values and appearances of its elements through the declaration of its own existence and the formation of new terms. This can also be understood as a meta-state set which declares itself or names itself or counts itself by virtue of its existence. That is, by virtue of its presence, it marks itself in space, creates its own logic internally, and bears its own relationship to the world by its own criteria of affinities and values, which are generated by the participants through what Badiou has termed a collective political discipline. While seemingly functioning within the realm of a self-determining and democratic and indeed transformative political action, both Larouel in his anti badu from 20, uh, uh, 2011 and Gangle bring to our attention the political effectiveness of such a party of contradictory forces. While successful in their revolutionary ambition, we still leave no place for the ordinary human when a political problem takes a philosophical form that depends upon both an assumed a priori distinction between thought and power, as well as their a priori relation. Gangle maintains that philosophy will always inevitably insert itself into the political as such and is thus duplicated or redoubled within it. According to Larawell, it is precisely this question of the human as generic rather than enclosed and made particular in its anthropological set and the predisposition for a divisive philosophical mechanism within politics and the commons that typifies the conflict between non-philosophy and what Larawell terms the ontology of the void. Where Larawell claims that the abstraction of too narrow a conception of the generic makes Badiou's ontology hold um, in too high esteem the solitude of a set of individuals and strangers, not in generic non-philosophical sense, but rather in an all too differentiated and indeed hierarchized sense of a set. <laughs> Instead, Larawell takes Badiou's idea of the immigrant parallel to the idea of communism rather than that of, of humans as they exist in a generic body or stance, that is to say, in one. Larawell cautions us about the possibility within such an ontology of the void to allow or to render sublime the most problematic philosophical and indeed political acts if they take place within the sphere of doxa, that is, if they are to support the continuation of a sufficiently revolutionary political philosophical movement. In summary then, the non-philosophical contention with philosophy's engagement with the political as a practice for life is that while it speaks of equality, democracy and freedom as concepts, it fails to address the inequality and capture from which the foundations of its own systems of thought from the foundations of its own systems of thought and can thus never truly achieve anything for ordinary life, but, an, but can ultimately and violently make more strangers in the world and thus more material for its own reproduction. Okay, final section. Beyond the one and the multiple, Schmidt's example of collective intimacy via a non-epistemology. Objects are given either by tradition or by current science. They are heterogeneous, but relations are expressed between these objects. 
it is not simply a question of exhibiting knowledge, but also one's relation to it and the stances taken in relation to the concept and the sensible alike. It is the twofold relation, a relation to content of knowledge and to intimacy. Through her non-standard or generic epistemology, Anne Francois Smith demonstrates a new approach, not just for reading objects uh, that have already been formed, but for understanding and indeed creating non-standard objects. These non-standard objects are not sufficiently tangible through any one history, language, or distance, but rather demand a certain radical underdetermination in their integrated overlap and in their conceptual asymmetry with any single logic. This underdetermination mm -hmm. should not be confused with the indeterminacy of the object of relational aesthetics. That is, a placeholder devoid of its own identity or meaning, but rather this object takes its multifarious character from the processual nature of its construction and activity within one space or another. Here, the collider described in this chapter acts also as an example, expanding with Smith's epistemology and developing on from what Laraval describes as the matrix and the constitution of what he would call the subject and possess and what Schmidt has nominated the integrated object. Explicating what I see here as an overlap in their respective projects, this can be applied to the development of a new methodology and a new way of seeing and making in art and its practice. While it is clear from the previous discussion that Schmidt's thought shares conceptual ground with Laruel, in their thinking through the intersection of science and philosophy, where Laruel creates abstractions via the quantum to escape the circular abstraction philosophy, Schmidt's non-epistemology creates indeterminary axioms between abstraction and action. That is, she creates non-models and hypotheses through her practice across various disciplines and uses these directly in solving problems. Relative to the aims of this thesis and the development of a non-standard theory and practice of art as a collectivizing force, two key concepts are useful to us in imagining the conjunction of aleatory subjects in one and the form in the form of a loving aggregate. The first is the concept of collective intimacy, wherein Schmidt develops a way to model a non-standard relation or a non-relation of subjects and disciplines. And the second, which relates specifically to the category of object produced in such a non-relation and its multi-state function is that of the integrative object. For Schmidt, collective intimacy is a model of scientific exchange which no longer depends upon disciplinary logic, but allows for the construction of a commons whose contents cannot be reduced to a single regulating method. For the purpose of this thesis, this proposition has much to lend to a theory of loving aggregation, where radically different subjects and objects are brought into commons together, and more importantly, are engaged in the creative production of new knowledge across multiple media and disciplines. In her essay, Madonna on the, creator, on the Craters of the Moon, an Aesthetic Epistemology, published by Ergonomic in 2015, Schmidt takes the historical example of Ludovico Cardi and Cigoli, Assumption of the Virgin, and explores it as the subject of a non-standard epistemological inquiry. Schmidt observes this 16th century painting as a superposition between the most advanced scientific discovery at the time, the moon, and its topography, and the sublime representation of an object of faith, the Virgin ascending to the heavens. These two wonders are perhaps now seen in complete contradiction, but within this work, they sit together in aesthetic unity. Schmidt writes, in the Madonna on the Craters, mm -hmm. Chigoli's moon, we find a sort of non-synthesis between that which comes from religion and that which comes from Galilean science. Science is like a foreign body in the spiritual atmosphere of the painting, and it is, and in this, I'm sorry, and in its sight, the church. And yet, certain elements of the painting suggest ways in, such as the fabrics or the nuances of light, and the very painting form itself as a completed work or mannerism, interpreted not only as knowledge of the painted object, but as a relation to that object the intention of the painter or spectator, allowing this synthesis to be recomposed. Our hypothesis is that current science cannot be completely reunified either by 
epistemology, nor art, by aesthetics, understood as, an all, as all surveying modes of knowledge, we must take account of their higher heterogeneity, which is not reducible to one discipline or another. Epistemology places at our disposal various models or fragments of science, just as aesthetics provides us with models of the work of art, and their superposition brings out emergent elements. So moving from Schmidt's classical example of art and the generative moment of the non-synthetic superposition of ideas and images, in the next chapter, I will develop both an understanding of the extensions of these tendencies within contemporary art and a hypothesis of cross-disciplinary non-synthesis using examples from current art practice with reference to my own video work. The following chapters will call upon the ideas of art theorists to build a bridge in thought from the non-philosophy of chapter one to a more generative language which superposes both terms and thoughts across disciplines to formulate what will later be described as a fuller picture. So um, that is the end of the reading. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know it's quite a long piece. Um, I hope that it was enjoyable in terms of connecting and like letting it wash over you basically because there's so much in there. It's like sort of an impossible thing to, to take in as a reading. Um, but hopefully there were some points of resonance, certainly with the diagrams and some of the things that I talked about. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, take a, a little break maybe. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, we could do questions on that or we could go straight to the screening and then talk at the very end. And that's kind of up, up for debate. What would you like to do? I think probably it's up to you uh, if you're if you want to like I have some questions or some res like responses but I can wait okay I think um just to make sure that we don't go we're here for an hour and a half and start a five so we'll, I think I'll show the films and then if there's we can go into extra time and questions I just want to make sure that everyone gets to the films as well so just give me one moment and the first okay. one I Thank might you know what? I might just play one, the piece with Anne Francoise and Francois, and that'll leave sufficient time for a little chat after. And um, I think that's probably the best. Okay, so um, I'm just going to get, get it up. The object.
Peut-être parce le sujet qui est dans le travail maintenant. Présentation, je pense bien assez bien parce qu'il y a un mouvement ondulatoire, il y a de l'eau, ça sur un bateau, il y a de l'eau. Il y a de la musique, il y a des chants. Et ce que ce qui m'intéresse de faire, c'est de chercher l'affinité qu'il peut y avoir entre la musique et certains thèmes ou certaines pratiques de la philosophie. Ce qui m'intéresse, c'est, comment dire, s'il y a un point de, de fusion, justement, ou d'intrication, de communication très étroite entre la philosophie et la musique. Alors, évidemment, c'est une certaine banale, dans un sens, au sens où la... Où la, où la musique a toujours été comparée à la philosophie et la philosophie à la musique, en particulier chez Socrate, évidemment. Donc, euh, en partir d'un pont d'une origine grecque, c'est un problème grec, en réalité, mais qui vaut d'une certaine manière pour toute la, la tradition occidentale. Alors, la musique... J'aimerais que la musique soit un modèle pour la pensée. Mais évidemment, c'est un pari, c'est une gâture. Parce qu'en réalité, la communication entre les deux, philosophie et musique, est très problématique, et très, très pas banale du tout. Alors, on peut croire que c'est banal, mais ça n'est pas banal. Alors, euh, il y a des formules directrices de Socrate, là. la philosophie et la philosophie musique, et on pourrait la retourner, la musique, et d'une certaine manière, la plus belle des philosophies. j'essaye de faire actuellement, je cherche à rapprocher au maximum la philosophie et la musique, au maximum, c'est-à-dire ne pas considérer simplement la philosophie comme, euh, 
une expression sensible, émotive, qui fait penser à de la musique. Ça, c'est quand même assez banal. Et mon problème est un peu plus technique, c'est-à-dire c'est de trouver des structures, des structures d'organisation de l'expression qui soient très proches dans la philosophie et dans la musique. Alors évidemment, il n'y a, a pas de sonorité dans la philosophie. Elle est insonore, insonore ou insonore. Mais il est intéressant de chercher au-delà de la simple sonorité quelque chose qui serait qui serait commun en quelque sorte presque des notes des intervalles des wow. oui des intervalles entre concepts qui pourraient avoir un point commun avec des intervalles entre des notes Et je pense que c'est une très bonne image des objets qui sont tous trop de 
Il y a quelque chose à Là, il vous adresser. Il y a quelque chose à nous. Voilà. Là, comme ça, ça vient. C'est une tour qui ne tient pas. C'est une tour de piste qui. qui... Bon, Richard, tu as, tu as assez joué. C'est un objet. Eh bien, d'une certaine manière, cet objet-là, pour revenir à lui, représente assez cette journée mm -hmm. euh, qui a été diversement aiguë ou, ou intéressante. Enfin, je suis très content d'avoir eu l'occasion, euh, la motivation de, pour parler de, de choses hein, qui sortent un peu de de l'ordinaire, euh, même un peu de notre ordinaire, qui n'est déjà pas tout à fait ordinaire. Mais enfin, quand même, ça sort déjà de, de cet ordinaire. C'est vrai. On imagine que l'ordinaire est plat. Pour moi, l'ordinaire des Anglais, c'est un, un équivalent de transcendantal. Hein? C'est une sorte de transcendantal. Et ça, ça casse le transcendantal. Mais ça casse aussi l'empirique. Ça casse, au fond, toutes les représentations qu'on peut avoir. Et donc, c'est ça, véritablement, un objet. C'est quelque chose qui ne, qui ne se fond ni dans le discours, ni dans l'expérience, ni dans... C'est un objet. Merci. Voilà. Ah, merci. Oui. Et il faut, je pense, euh, hop, 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 hop. Il y a longtemps que ça n'a plus été colophané. Lots of humor there and very um, much about this experience or this also very much biographical. There's this um, kind of a document of the of the of the relationship that Anne Françoise and, and Francois and I have, have built over time around the work that we do. And um, yeah, I think you really see their generosity towards me as well. Now I'm a bit older and I'm like they participated in this crazy project of mine trying to uh, sort of strain uh, the relationship between art and philosophy, but also uh, in so doing and creating that space, uh, we made a really nice piece of film that also in terms of posterity is something that I think grows more important. And, um, hearing Francois talk about his very recent work at that time around, our, uh, around philosophy and music, and then also hearing Anne Francois talk about um, you know, the open object. And, These are all things that they each developed and still did later on. And yeah, it has this new kind of historical dimension to it that's very meaningful to me. And, um, and also a bit of fun. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And you can uh, view it on our website as well. And, and you can also view the second film if you didn't have time to watch it. Um, if you want to see the second part of it. Um, so I guess, um, I've got about 10 minutes or so to take some questions or comments. Um, I guess I'd focus on if the students have any questions uh, first and then maybe take some comments from the other presenters. That would be the best. I think I'm the only student here, so. Hi, oh. <laughs> uh, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for, for attending. Very enjoyed it um and yeah i had a question about um something you said during your uh, when you were reading your thesis out about um in terms of the uh, democracy of thought uh more is always better or uh, you know uh, the more models and the more disciplines brought to bear um the kind of um uh 
you know, the more um, potential, I guess, for uh, for also something that uh, Laura said in the video to do. of uh, to stick with like a musical way of speaking is there a difference in terms of is there a significant difference between a note or a chord in terms of uh is the question of quantity i guess relevant to the democracy of thought and disciplines uh the reason i ask i guess is uh if the real is kind of for, at the real or at the individual of are foreclosed to thought and kind of uh, you know have their own sufficiency um does the question of quantity come into play because it seems like it does have some relevance uh but for me it's slightly contradictory with that idea if that makes sense yeah um i suppose um but it's important to caveat is that like I don't presume uh, to to know uh, Lara Wells mind on this uh, matter for me um, the idea of, of something being kind of uh, like a idea of something being polyvocal and multi it's like if everyone can only have like a certain partial aspect or understanding um, of, 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 of the world um, and um, and only a very partial and kind of um, contracted interpretation of, 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 of the real of the one and um, then kind of multiple perspectives and multiple experiences create um, a more um, a richer deeper and um, um, a more um, I guess what I would think of because we're talking about kind of art and music here is a more stimulating and multivocal um, space and, and experience um, and for an interpretation I guess as a viewer or a reader or a listener um, so it is really about that kind of the multiplicity um, not of the idea that we could have more and more and somehow we'll have the whole thing someday, but rather just the, the, the variation in perspective and experience creates um, fuller and, um, and richer um, and uh, I guess potentially, um, I guess, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's about like the more input and perspective on, on, a, on a kind of a, a on an object or thinking through an object, the, the, the greater potential for, for, um, for diversification and understanding and, and enjoyment is present in that. That's, I guess that's, that's the way I would think about it and kind of, that's also why I collaborate. It's, it's very much a kind of a principle in, of, 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 of making in my practice as well. And, um, and it also creates this kind of, this real life testing of what it is to kind of, to, to, kind of be together and be different and this kind of um and a collective intimacy as a kind of a as a as a way of being in relation to others and thinking about that as a productive space and the tensions that arise from that and kind of collisionary process in many ways um, you know that, that is that is proliferated and made richer by multiple kind of voices and, 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 and disciplines and, and thought and i guess that would be my response to your to your question i hopefully that kind of elucidates some of it but uh yeah it's uh Thank you. Ivan, do you have any thoughts, maybe? I know you're not the student, but... Um, no, uh, thank you. It was, it was uh, very, very rich and very good. I, it, I, I don't have really a question. I have some thoughts, but I think they are not... Uh, they're not really... I don't. I, I. I don't think it's. A, it's. A, if it's a good idea that I, I share them now, it's just. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's also like with just in terms of the organizers. Like this is the, like we can have a chat about this whenever you like. I just more particularly just for the students that is here, just to give a bit of space to, to talk about anything. Um. But yeah, I mean, we all know each other. We could have. We could have a little correspondence. Even I'd love if you want at a, at some stage you could write to one another or something like that. That would also be really potent. Well, I guess, um, yeah, if Sayan doesn't have any other questions, um, I'm happy to 
thank you and goodbye and good night. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I do uh, have a question because okay. I, I didn't mean to. Put you in the phone. <laughs> I was just, I just wanted to make sure you could ask like we, that you felt comfortable to ask, that's all. I mean, yeah, you know. Sure, but it, no, because I, I kept uh, asking myself during the presentation um, about the potential links between what you were talking about and the concrete. And I saw many links, but I, I, I wanted to ask you what for you are the, the link between, between what we were discussing until now in the course about the discrete and the serpentine line and uh, what you were uh, talking about. I think it maybe also links back to what Leon said about this idea of many disciplines kind of reaching and attempting to uh, kind of connect or conceptualize something that is outside of, of their uh, discrete knowledges. Um, and I think that's it. That's sort of that's for me when I saw that this was one of the ideas and looking at the kind of abstracts of the course. And um, this is kind of an unfinished piece of work for me. And I saw this as a nice context to start to share that. And you know, this writing that I've done was done, um, you know, between like 2012 and and 2017. So quite prior to this. But it's like I felt a lot of resonances with the, with the, with the with the with the kind of I guess the endeavor of the course ideas. Um, and I really like to hear you your ideas in terms of the resonance of, of someone who's kind of been sitting in. And it's really nice just to, to share this with this group for that reason. Is that I felt like oh this is a thing I've been really thinking about a lot and. Um, yeah, it felt like a home for it to be to be kind of to, to share and maybe doesn't like I don't see it as like linking directly with everything that's in the course, but rather that it kind of yeah like certain things sort of kind of hum and work and and hopefully it was a kind of a nice sort of supplement or kind of an a, a, an additional sort of piece that sat alongside the kind of main body of the course. To comment just briefly on on that, I mean I think one of like. One of the courses we discussed like abducted, like ma manipulative abducted abduction. So having like epistemological objects, but how these actually kind of spur hypotheses, like why, why people, you know, uh, Magnani is an Italian philosopher, we were quoting for this. And I find a lot of resonance there with the, with the film, like, and how this sort of sparks this continuity of the narrative is this, you know, ordinary but a weird, weird object. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, and thinking about um, it also kind of creates this this talking point in the link um between Anne Francoise and Francois and people Pekin in the second film that I you know you can view in your own time. But I take that same object to Sierra Leone and I write a play a, like a, a kind of a, a comedy play with uh with people Pekin who's a comedian and performer there, and we video that. And so it also creates this kind of interdimensional kind of connection. Um, I actually wrote an introduction to the film that I forgot to read out. <laughs> I'm just like, I should have done that. Um, but I, uh, I'll, throw, I'll throw it on the screen because it is actually quite helpful or to speak to much of what you said there. Uh, um, and also like kind of the, another topic that we were discussing um, was, and Zane was kind of talking a, a little bit about it as well, is, like you um we were we've been using the uh we're trying to think of like counterpoint as a model or a similar for a superposition and i think counterpoint works well with the way that the the texture of the film was as you're holding the object up whether the zooming or the the kind of how it kind of sat in counterpoint to your to the scenes as well was pretty interesting I, I know that that balcony very well in in their home. Yeah. <laughs> so I've seen those buildings a lot. I smoke a lot out there, but yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it's also kind of like disrupting of any kind of uh, like the tropes of documentary filmmaking or any idea that this is some kind of definite document of this person, their ideas and their thinking. That the the sculpture kind of uh, interrupts um, and sort of reminds us of the kind of uh, the uh, uh, lack of kind of clarity and perfection that 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 we're we're kind of handling, and it's sort of it's it's self a damaged object. It's itself a kind of a it has kind of no meaning, but also has 
often it's almost like kind of a MacGuffin um, in, in how it kind of functions in conversation and then yeah it kind of generates con conceptual discussion and conceptual um, uh, expansion um, and uh, yeah and it is also sort of playing with this interaction of philosophy and art and um, how that can be quite farcical at times but also can be quite a generative space as well um, in the right hand. Right like how when you had the objects like Put up towards the building but also towards her playing music and all uh, and when you're discussing the the i don't know what piece that is uh, but when you're discussing the work and uh, the artwork as well so uh, i like the yeah that's like a public mural just in the park down the road um there wasn't uh we looked around actually i think we looked for the name of the artist but it was just that yeah it's like a beautiful public artwork and there's a lot of like actual concrete in that space as well, which I thought was kind of a nice thing to look at as well. Um, mm -hmm. It is this kind of a very like um, ordinary space, like public space. Um, we got the bus and we sat in the park and we had a lot of uh, kids running around kicking balls. And I decided to keep all those kind of ambient noises in the, in the film as well, to kind of, again, give that sense of it being a very kind of a, uh, yeah, just quite a, a domestic kind of experience in many ways also. Yeah, the, it was very intimate. I liked it. Thank you for that. Um, but I'll, I'll allow you to, if you want to discuss this, what you have on screen. Um, oh, yeah, no, I just thought I'd put it up there just because it is like a little a little bit of information on the mm -hmm. film. But um, yeah, so um, really, yeah, just kind of thinking that through the medium of film that the sculpture creates this sort of material and gestural linkage between this, the disjunctures in geography and time. Um, um, particularly um, kind of that the sculpture travels and it kind of becomes this kind of prop or conversational object in multiple mm -hmm. contexts. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's kind of it really, that this idea of the kind of repetition and recoding of the object across different locations and timelines that it then kind of is this sort of generative proliferating um, kind of second thing. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it really. I've sort of run out of stuff now, lads. <laughs> Um, yeah, I understand. Um, but yeah, it's sort of um, yeah, um, it's been nice because this is also like work I haven't looked at for a really long time. So it's kind of coming back to it and thinking about it again. And um, it's been really interesting and sort of thinking about that object and and uh, yeah, and and the things that it's managed to start. Um, and I think that that's kind of a nice thing, maybe a nice note to end it. I wonder if uh, Anne Francoise, um, if you want to add anything. There we go. And Francois, you're muted. Just yes. Muted. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. It was very, very impressive. And uh, yes. Um, you have from the art, uh, de, depuis, depuis l'art, one uh, un understanding of philosophy, very interesting. You, you show us that we have to, to use as a discipline to understand philosophy, and it is very important. And your object is a link, an intermediary object. You can pass from hands to hands as if Art and philosophy can be the object of people with democracy. So it is very, very interesting theoretically because theory change. Yeah. Theory change without be an emotive as 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 said François, uh, an emotive uh, uh, thing, but to integrate in philosophy sounds, colors, uh, touch, and to create links, different links between philosophy and other disciplines. And I think in this movement, philosophy becomes concrete. Mm. Here, your concrete is the cross. 
between serpentine line object and collective intimacy. Collective intimacy is a sort uh, of a sort of unity uh, for the integrative object. An integrative object plus intimate collective intimacy, this is the body. Mm. That's really interesting. Do you do you agree? Yeah. With I this? Agree. Yeah, I really yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Alice, tu ne veux pas montrer quelques-unes de tes œuvres oh. ou tu préfères ne pas en montrer? Uh, montrer ce, que, ce que tu nous as donné, tu sais, avec la ligne serpentine. Oui. Tu sais, tu ne veux, tu veux pas nous montrer cela? Uh, you want me to show it? Yes, si tu acceptes. Yeah. If you accept. Give me one moment, I'll show the picture. Yes, yes. It is serpentine line, bodies and materials in this in this uh, uh, work. Made in Munich. So the serpent, ah, the, the, the serpent in line. <laughs> yeah, the serpent, the serpent stuff escalated uh, towards yes. the <laughs> Um Yes, this is um, this is much more recent work in, in sculpture and clay, and um, quite ex it's a snake. Um, so, uh, but it's not a snake. It's kind of, it's kind of a, an ambiguous kind of creature where he he's nominally a snake, but also like what snake looks like that. Um, and he has these kind of mm -hmm. other types of features, so he's kind of his own mythical, strange mm -hmm. kind of boy, and he comes to the party with his dance. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh. These are more, this is more around the body, mm -hmm. um, but they had, mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's another kind of serpentine piece that I just thought I would share. I think these are the ones that I'm very specifically serpentine, and the invitation around the uh, text for my next exhibition in Munich is very much kind of thinking about these um, but yeah. Um, yeah that's my study thinking also about the um, consistently open uh, intersectional lines of the yes. standard transdisciplinarity that I talked about no circular non-circular um, <laughs> and also the kind of there's a certain level of sort of confrontation within the serpentine uh, collaboration that is like generative and essential uh, to the to progress and to the, the connection. And I think that that like for me, it's also really about articulating the um, kind of lived experience of collaboration and interdisciplinarity as as also meeting and working with people from other disciplines um, rather than a kind of self-contained interdisciplinarity where you're leading multiple different kind of own knowledge production and bringing them together in your own space but actually this kind of collaborative um kind of communal kind of knowledge production um and uh how that's not actually very easy to involve and um, involves a lot of patience and um sort of making space in yourself for other people um and these kind of um kind of sensitizing kind of practices and it doesn't work with if we don't have this kind of capability for that yeah, that, that feels like something I'd like to write about kind of going forward is about this kind of very sort of first person with the learning of, of this kind of um, working with others. Mm -hmm. Can you show too the the picture with your grandmother and the cotton? It's possible? <laughs> I, I, I didn't have I didn't have these ones prepared. I'll just have a quick request <laughs> handy. And I'm sorry, I don't have it on this computer. <laughs> Désolé, 
ce n'est pas sur cet ordinateur, c'est dans la vie. Ah, dommage. Yeah. <rire> um, okay. um, Mais tes lignes serpentines qui sont, qui oui. sont des bodies, oui, oui. c'est extraordinaire. C'est une ligne, uh, aussi une ligne de, um, it's like a line of legacy, also this idea of um, the serpentine line within the family line, and that, um, yes. the idea of, of kind of certain types of, of inheritance, sort of this kind of un, unclosed and continuing sort of line that's kind of intertemporal and intergenerational. Um, quite, these are the sort of things that I, are unresolved, but kind of stimulating my mind at the moment. And I just see, um, put in a little thing um collision of discipline collision of disciplines expands the numbers of hypothesis available for testing yeah i totally agree with that um yeah i think yeah, that's, that's, just... that's really it in one yeah for sure that's much better expressed than my version there where i kind of just went off on a load of tangents but yeah that's really it in one it does it just expands the possibility um and um yeah the more hypothesis available for testing the kind of greater Um, possibilities for, for the production of new knowledges and, and expanding knowledges. Ah, and Francois is putting up the, the picture that I sent, which is the photograph with my grandmother in it. Um, and it's a kind of, yeah, beautiful. Um, I sent her a postcard with the image on it, and I had an opening in. Um, oh, that looks really cool. Do it, encore, encore for moi. Ah, d'accord. Oui, oui, pardon. I want to photograph it on the screen. It's kind of doing something interesting. Hi. Merci. <laughs> C'est bien. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go. Uh, but thanks so much for having me. It was really interesting. And yes. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to return to this. Alice? Yes. Yeah. Can you be with us when Yvonne would be explained? the concrete in art um I'm it's not, possible i'm not sure yet i think that i actually have another engagement on that saturday oh. i'm sorry about that um, <laughs> but i will i will look at the recording and and then hopefully hopefully even and i okay okay <laughs> thank you for your time and for sharing yeah. um yeah. thanks thanks for having me it was really yeah. it was yeah kind of interesting to come back to this stuff and and uh or to come back it's also like kind of coming back to who i was when i wrote it which is kind of interesting as well um <laughs> cool well thank you so much everybody and have a lovely evening and uh yeah it was really lovely to speak to you today. Thank thanks you. so much thank you Ali. thank you so much